is Dr. Joyce Bluford. I'm the board president of the Math Science Nucleus, and I'm a scientist who studies the rocks, and that's called geologist. But today, we're going to look about how all forces on our Earth, so this is our Earth here, how they influence our lives and how things move because of the forces that we have here. So we're really going to be talking about a branch of science called physics. Physics describes the natural world around us, and it helps us understand why things happen the way they are. So um, let's start looking at forces on Earth. Now, if you notice, there is a young lady, and she's playing with do you know what that is? It's called a Chinese yo-yo. And what she's doing, now if she was on the moon and she let it go, it would just keep going up. But because we have a force called gravity that pulls it down. And so this is how we're gonna learn about how different toys work, how different things in our world actually um, are controlled by one of the major forces called gravity. Now, if you notice on the right-hand side, there's something else going on. Those little black balls are not only little black balls, but they are magnets, they're magnetic balls. And as you can see, there's a force controlling them. Some things are being repelled, some things are being attracted. So we're gonna learn about that kind of force called electromagnetic forces. So these are the two big forces we're going to deal with today as we go through our scientific journey on forces. Now, let me go over this again. There's four major forces on our earth that humans have to deal with. Two of them we're not gonna talk about today because they're a, a little um, on the nuclear level. There's what we call the weak force, and that's at the atomic level. And we have a strong force, which is on the subatomic level. That's the first you have to understand a little bit about elements and how things combine and work. So we won't go into those. But the two that really affect us the most, and the ones we should understand a little bit more, are gravity. And that is the force of the Earth kind of pulling us down. It's the force of the planets going around so gravity is throughout our universe that we have to whoop i just broke the sun um so gravity is something that we need to understand and it's due to motion in the universe then we're going to take a look at electromagnetic force and that's negative and positive and north and south we're going to take a look at how those two are together in electromagnetic forces so if you look at that picture over there um, on the right there's the sun in the mi middle and if you notice by gravitational attraction and that what that me means is something that's really large in the universe attracts something and in this case it's attracting the planet earth now if you notice there's something going around the earth. What is that? That's the moon. That's because the earth is bigger than the moon and it's attracting it. So let's take a look at a little bit more about motion. And we want to um, emphasize a man by the name of Sir Isaac Newton. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician, and he wondered about the world around him. Um, he wanted to understand why, and some of you might know this story, why an apple falls down. Because um, back in the 1500s when he was alive, most people just didn't know what was going on. And he started to look at things. Now, look at that picture to the right. What is that? It's called a drop-down uh, tower. Um, if you go to an amusement park and you go buy a ticket and you go up on the top, you go down and it's a free fall. Oh my goodness. Has anybody ever done that? It's kind of scary. And it, as it goes down, 
you're accelerating, you're going super fast. And then your insights kind of like go upwards and it, it gives you this kind of weird feeling of um, dropping. But it's this, um, so what Sir, Sir Isaac Newton, he had three laws of motion. And one of them is that if you keep, if unless you have something breaking a fall, it will continue. Like for instance, if, if you're up there and there wasn't an earth, what would happen? You would just keep going down and down. And that's actually what happens out in space without influence of gravity. Now, if you also see the second one in red, it says force equals mass times acceleration. Well, gravity is kind of weird. As it's pulling you, it's accelerating. It's going faster and faster. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So that's the second that this is um, showing you as it's going down, you're accelerating. That's why you get this weird free fall feeling. And then for every action, there's an opposite reaction. In the case of this, as it's going down, you're feeling going down, but the way why you feel it is because your body is saying, oh no, I don't want to do this. And so it's like your organs want to go up. So this is uh, how Newton started looking at the world. Okay, now let's take a look about that free fall. Notice the heavier an object is, doesn't mean it goes down faster. Look at book one, look at book two, look at book three, and look at book four. As you notice, they hit the ground at the same time. Doesn't matter how heavy it is. And that's because gravity, gravity is um, kind of weird. It just accelerates it at a certain rate. And that's what you're seeing there. So sometimes if you have a feather, and this is a common um, experiment, if you have a feather and drop it, it doesn't go the same as if you had a ball. But the feather, if you have air, it will uh, hold it up. But if you're in a vacuum where there is no air, that feather and the ball would drop down at the same, just like these different books. So it's kind of weird, this gravity. And that's what got Sir Isaac Newton all excited. He wanted to know why this occurs. Now, Let's take a look at something that uh, Phoebe is going to do here for us. She has this little instrument and she's gonna try to show you that it takes, you can accelerate or get a higher speed. So let's see what Phoebe is gonna talk about. Let's do an experiment. Let's see how high we have to put the marble on the ramp to get it to complete the loop. This is level one. So not quite. Level two, and level three. Ah, so it accelerated and made it go faster. Um, and it allowed it to go around that loop. So like when Phoebe had it at certain points, there was something what we call potential energy. And when she releases it, that's what we call kinetic. I might use these words later on, and I want to make sure that you at least um, heard them before. So uh, kinetic is when it's actually going and potential is when you get, when it has the potential of giving you more energy. So let's continue. Now, this is another, we want to look at centripetal force and centrifugal force, which is all part of the gravity, because this is going to be important and understand how gravity works on earth. Now, Let's look at what Phoebe's going to do here. Make this ball under this top edge without it falling down. And now, what happens if we stop? Ah, circular motion. Now, this is going to be key, guys. Circular motion helps defy gravity. And we're going to see this in a lot of toys that we have. Having mo motion kind of controls it. And when you have an inward force, so when she was twirling it around, there was a force uh, pushing one way and another force because it was going fast and moving, pushing it the other way. So then it stays on the track. But as soon as the motion stops, what happened to the ball? 
it falls down. Let's look at this. So this is what we call centripetal force. And actually, you are experiencing it all the time. You just don't know it because you just think this is normal. Now, centrifugal force is, well, let's take a look at what this lady is doing. You observe when she releases the ball that it comes back to her. But look at the what's going on on the left. If you're a Martian hoovering over her, you see that as a straight line. What? Yeah, we're going to see that in the universe. It depends on how you're looking at motion. Because we are in the Earth's gravity, we don't feel things. But yet, there's a consequences or another force. And although we don't think about it, this becomes real important in understanding how our earth works. Because you got to remember, our earth is not just hanging out there. It is going around on its axis. It's rotating. And it is also revolving around the sun. And that kind of motion has consequences. So I know this looks weird. Now you could go on a merry-go-round and do this yourself and see the ball. And then you could look almost on the top and you could see the red line going as a straight line. Now, how does that have consequence? Well, let's look at our oceans. Okay, so if you're noticing, the oceans are starting to move. And remember also, this is twirling around. We had to stop frame it, but is there a difference between like solid earth and water? Water moves will be influenced by the centrifugal force and it causes the moving of the currents. Now you go, who cares about that? That has nothing to do about what we're doing. But you've all heard about climate change, haven't you? Everybody talks about it, but, and they say the glaciers are, are melting, but they don't realize that because the water ha is a liquid, it starts rotating and moving differently just by one degree of temperature. And it causes havoc on our, our weather systems, which in turn, over long term, changes our climate. And so this is actually pretty complicated. But just to tell you, that's what you're learning this for, is the beginnings of understanding how these forces on Earth can influence our lives. Now, let's take a look at a yo-yo. Now, a yo-yo is, you guys have seen a yo-yo like this. Now, if you notice, you always have to kind of wind it up. And then when it goes down, look at the young lady on the right. Now notice her hand. What happens? Does she go up and down or she just lets it go? Because if you just let it go, will it come back up? No. She's trying to keep the motion going so it defies gravity. Now look at on the left, and that's an astronaut playing with a yo-yo. Yes, astronauts actually play too. Now notice that he can defy some of the gravity as long as it's attached to the string. If it's not attached to the string, it will use the law of motion of going in a straight line. And so the yo-yo is dependent on uh, gravity and it is the twirling that is almost like what, what I like to refer to as anti-gravity in um, your ages here. Okay, now, we're gonna take a look at, and you can do this at home just with a quarter or a dollar, twirling it around. But I want us to look at this wobble because everybody hopefully knows that the earth is kind of wobbling a little. And that actually has something to do with um, how movement on our earth's surface occurs. Um, but let's take a look at this. And I want you to say, is this rotating? Is that disc going around? So you're going to have to look at it that's how it's going back and forth. That's what we call the problem. It's going around. Notice the surface. Smooth and a little shallow. That's the surface. That was double. Is it going faster? Is it going slower? Is it moving? Is it concentrating toward the middle? What is going to happen? 
going to continue forever and we're going to be watching this forever. Smaller, notice it goes up and down. Less and less, listen to the sound. Gravity took it over. And so it stopped wobbling and it start, stopped rotating. If the, uh, so you can do this on your own with, a, if you have a big coin and twirl it around and it will wobble and do the same thing. Not as nice as this Euclid disc, but it's kind of fun to understand why does all this happen? It's because gravity is taking hold of it. Now let's take a look at this one. Is this centrifugal? or centripetal? Well, it's centripetal when it's going around, but as soon as he removes it, what happens? It's going in a straight line and will continue in that straight line until it hits something and then bounces off. That's kind of like when you play pool or any of those kind of games where you have to hit stuff marbles and you have to see it move like that. So this is all of what, why does it happen? So the next time you play with some of these things, Think about how it's working. Like good baseball players, basketball players, when they have a ball and it has to hit against something, they have to understand what angle it's going to go into in order to make it go where it wants to. And so we have physics in our life every day and we're always trying to overcome this gravity in different ways. Now, all of you have seen a hula hoop, some of you, can do it really well. Some of you, like me, can't do it at all. Let's see the secret of a hula hoop. Okay, well, got two secrets. You have to be moving in order to keep it up. But a lot of people can't keep it up on their hips and, and it just falls down because something's wrong. And that's because in order, not only does it have to go circular, but your body has to be moving it upward. And so that's why the motion that Phoebe had was kind, you're using the hips to make an upward motion. And so a lot of people don't even realize that, that, that that's what they've learned because they just trial and error. But that is the secret to a hula hoop and what and that was centripetal force okay now let's look at another one now amusement parks use anti-gravity and gravity all the time to scare you look at this one what happens they're on the side and the bottom falls from you now why don't they just fall down that's centripetal that is the forces forcing you against the side. Now, if it all of a sudden stopped, what would happen to those kids? They would just be going all over the place because they would go probably inward and fall and hurt themselves. But this is using, so amusement park people and actually the people who design almost all of those amusement park uh, um, apparatuses are physicists. They have to calculate exactly how this will scare you and make you feel weird, but not hurt you. Now, even a plain old merry-go-round. Uh, why are the kids holding on? If it goes too fast, what would happen? That centripetal force would force them in off of it. So that's why you basically have to hold down even a simple merry-go-round. If it goes too fast, then these kids are in trouble. Okay, now I'm sure all of you have gone on a, what did they call that? Costa, um, ah, what did they call it? <laughs> I got you guys, I got you. Oh my gosh, you 
did it! <laughs> Wants to do it again, huh? Well, this is a whole roller coaster idea and experience. Remember, and you'd have to go, remember on Phoebe's little experiment, if you want to go over yourself, you have to create enough acceleration to make a loop. But why this feels so weird? And if you didn't have those safety precautions, you would just fly out. But your organs inside are trying to go normal. So like if the force is going down, your body wants to go this way. And so you feel this almost sometimes, you know, people throw up because their, their internal organs get kind of this weird feeling. So, um, but that is all physics guys and a physicist would have to develop that. Let's take a look at a scientific instrument called a centrifuge, which is over to your bottom right. And that's how we separate out materials. So you, it also has other uses other than just having fun. But all of these different kinds of amusement park um, no, facilities do something different to make you feel weird from mainly gravity. Okay, now let's take a look at these two. The one on the bottom right is a normal Ferris wheel that we're used to with our electricity. But notice in the left, this is in a remote village in Indonesia. What are those guys doing? And look at how their body is kind of if they just if they let go they would go flying they're self-generating it with their body you have to be pretty strong and brave to do that especially look at that guy he pushes over if he wasn't strong enough he would just get flung over but they didn't have electricity but they wanted to have fun too okay now let's take a look at for every action, there is an equal reaction. Now, we're going to be looking at a, a, an apparatus called um, a Newton's cradles. And we're going to see how these little balls um, can illustrate this very well. So let's go to Phoebe and let's see what Phoebe can teach us. This right here is Newton's cradle. So let's first see what happens when we pull one ball back. What about three? And four. No. What happens if we pull all five back? For every action, there's an opposite reaction. And the Newton's cradle is an excellent example of that. The forces go through it. So if you have so much force hitting this side, it has to react on the other side by the same force. And then the same thing if you take two, two on here. But when you take three, it has to transfer. So that one in the middle has to go to the other. Same with four. And then five is kind of self evidence It's not really hitting anything. So it's just going to continue to swing back and forth. Okay, now, so that is our little uh, unit on kind of gravity. Then we're going to come back to it when we start looking at different toys to try to figure out how they actually work. So I want to talk a little bit about electromagnetic waves. This is the second major force. And with electromagnetic waves, although you don't, it's you don't see it, you don't feel it sometimes, it's all around us. Just like light is an electromagnetic wave, microwaves, x-rays, uh, infrared waves, um, using our televisions, our telephones, all that is generating waves. And that uses a combination of electricity 
and magnetism. You gotta remember electricity, we usually think of as positive and negative, and it's a flow of electrons in that order. And then magnetism is a north and south. So it's this opposite forces, almost like some of Newton's laws, which actually apply. So let's take a look at how we can use it in our everyday lives. So you have to remember this electrical forces. And if you look at my hand, if this is positive and negative, and there is all around here, what's happening is it's hitting things and it goes back and forth. And that's why we call it a wave because it makes like a wave structure when you mathematically lay this out. That's why we call it a wave, but it is a force. Gravity's one, electromagnetic force is another. Okay, now on electricity, you have positive and negative. Okay, now positive and negative. Now how can that make force? Well, even if you um, like take, you can take electrons and you could do this yourself. See the little boy there? He got a balloon, he rubs it on his hair and he's taking electrons and those electrons are negative. And then he puts it to a positive source and it's kind of what, well, you know, you see it as a stick, but it's attracted to each other. Um, and so this is um, a very powerful force that we have learned and we've had so many inventors capture this power. You have to remember in the 1900s, people did not have electricity in their houses. Imagine a world without electricity. This is a very, very powerful force that humans have learned to capture, but it's not as obvious as the gravity. Okay, so how can electricity flow through humans? Well, let's look at this little experiment. This right here is an alien ball and they do some pretty weird things. So if I put my finger on the metal part here and then touch the other end, it goes off. And now we can see if it works with another person. So nothing happens, but if we connect. Ha, ah, look at that. It's creating a, what we call a series circuit. This is uh, an alien ball here, just so. So, it's, what is, so these are electrodes for electricity. And then my hand is going here. It's going to go on the surface of my skin and only when I connect and I complete the circuit. And then it's all spooky. So we also have learned that we can generate electricity. Now, let's take a look at this bulb. Notice the bulb is not up, but I'm going to turn this around. And look, I can generate electricity. Who generate? Have you heard that term? Now think about your home. You have a lot of electricity coming into your home. Very, very important part of our life. And that is a fundamental force on earth. Benjamin Franklin first realized it when he discovered static electricity and he learned or not discovered it, but he started to experiment on it and he found how you can move these electrons. And from that, he created the Franklin battery and then the battery was, the electrons are stored in there. And then a whole new way of controlling our world through electricity formulated and we are still learning more. Now, the other force that we have to deal with on our Earth is a magnetic force. Now, let's take a look at different magnets. Phoebe? This right here is a bar magnet. So it has a north side and a south side, and the north is marked with a line. So we know this side is the north, and now we can find the north and south poles of other magnets. This is a cow magnet right here. And whereas we bring these two ends together, these are drawn together, meaning this side is the south side of the cow magnet. But if we flip it over, there's a repulsion there. These two sides don't want to stick together, meaning this is the north side. So now we can try another magnet here. Remember this side is the north, and they attract. So this green face here is the south, but if we flip it over to the black side, Again, the magnets don't want to touch. So this is the north face of this magnet. 
And here we have some other ones. So this purple ring right here is a magnet. And when we take this orange one, they attract. So these two faces are opposites. But if we flip the orange ring over, they repel. It doesn't want to stick because now they're the same poles. And if we move over here to this magnet, we can look at the forces. So right now, none of the magnets are sticking together because they're all balanced. But if we move some closer, they attract. And then the forces become unbalanced. So magnetic forces are also um, part of our Earth. Now, at one time, a lot of scientists did not put electricity and magnetism together. It's when they started understanding the dynamo effect that uh, electricity or electricity can be created from magnetism. And that's part of when they made the combustion engine, when they, when they realized how to make energy through um, magnetism and electricity, it created a whole new industrial revolution. Okay, let's look at this. Let's look at this at slow motion. You can see the attraction north and south. It's pulling, it's, and then look, if you look over to the left-hand side, that is a north and south, and those are little magnetic filings, and you can see the force field. So magnetism creates a force field. And if you think about it, huh, our Earth, because it twirls around and because we have some molten type of rock inside, it's moving too, it creates a magnetic field around the earth. So we actually are dependent on magnetic forces to actually protect part of the earth because of that force that you see in that left hand um, picture is actually around the earth. So this is our North Pole, this is our South Pole, and we get those same kind of force fields around us. So forces are all around us, but we don't feel it. Now, let's take a look at some toys, because that's how we want to, um, you're still only third graders and you still play. But after today, I want you to start looking at your toys and try to figure out how they work. So let's read this story. Phoebe's going to read us a story on the crazy toy scientist. The Crazy Toy Scientist by Joyce Bluford, animated by Doris Rea and Hagos Tewaldi. Read by Phoebe Chen. There was a crazy toy scientist who wanted to invent cool toys. The toyologist would work day and night to bring fun to girls and boys. To discover how toys work, he would experiment in his lab. It would help decide what toys children would want to grab. First, the scientists had to figure what made toys behave, so the toyologist researched toys that children would want to save. The rubber tree in Central America inspired people 3,500 years ago to mix morning glory juice, creating a toy of bouncing dough. Escaping the Earth's gravity as a rubber ball it tries to go high in the air, but will only go down and fall. In the 15th century, enlightened scientists would use tin and metal springs to create the first wind-up toys that da Vinci made for kings. Simple wind-up toys use a spring. Wind them up and let them go. The toy will wiggle and walk and continue to tumble and roll. The cymbal bang monkey is one of these wind-up toys, was invented in the 1950s, clapping to everyone's joy. In 1913, people were building. Alfred Gilbert invented the erector set, miniature toy building structures to engineer a car, 
boat, or jet. In 1943, Richard James, a naval engineer, was looking to make instruments stable. He dropped a spring and the slinky was born, walking down his table. The Wheelow, marketed in the 1950s, uses metal that is magnetic, attracts a wheel to the edges, creating energy that is kinetic. The scientists learned chemistry creates materials children shape and mold. Concoctions can develop new toys. To children, it would be like having gold. Principles of mechanics could design toys to move and walk. Gears, springs, and metal, all they need is to talk. Physics explains other toys, including electricity, magnetism, and light. The toyologist just needed to invent a toy for children's delight. The scientist dreamed he invented a new toy, so he found a safe place for it to stay. When the scientist went to sleep, the toy came out to play. The toy used ideas from physics, even chemistry and mechanics. It was able to roll and talk, and had many human antics. The toy was shiny and big. It talked and bounced like a ball. Creating a large mess in the house, there were many a close call. Toys can be fun, but all is not what it seems. Science is behind how toys work, and that is not a dream. The end. So toys, even though you don't realize it, are actually designed. A lot of times physicists who like to play with toys when they were kids can help design toys. And what we're going to take a look at is some of the toys that um, kind of you play with and we want to figure out how they work. Like for instance, this lo little music box, how does that work? Well, there's a gear underneath here. But notice the little characters. Are they working? The gears are making energy to turn something around and it's turning a magnet around. And so what you have here is magnetic force and a music box. And so they've learned how to use magnetism to do all these toys. Now, normally the math science nucleus actually has field trips here to the Children's Natural History Museum. And we have a very popular class called the Physics of Toys. And we go through all of these different toys. And that's what we're gonna try to do today. I'm sorry you can't feel and touch them. We do have a lot of them in our museum shop, but um, yeah, which you can come visit when you want to. But let's take a look at Phoebe and she's gonna illustrate. Why does this toy levitate? Now, what's the word levitate mean? Levitate means to have nothing around it. Magicians use it um, to levitate things so you think it's magical. But what is going on here? Clue has something to do with a magnet. Now, a magnet attracts, if they're together, if north and north, they, do they come together? No, they do what they do, they repel. Now, if you have it at the right area, you can create a toy that levitates. So if they were both north, if there's north-south, they would, would um, attract each other, but there's the, uh, the same poles and so they, they repel and you have to design it at the right point. Just like when Phoebe, um, when Phoebe showed you this one right here, Notice these are in sync. And if I, I can actually start making them rotate and they'll kind of repel each other. And if they get too close, they will then, whoop, 
balance. So, so this is a kind of a fun little thing. This is how um, physicists actually start measuring how this all works. If you notice, there's a graph on the bottom. So there's all these cool ways of, of learning how these toys work. Okay, let's look at another toy. Now, in the storybook, there was something called the Wheelo. This was invented in the 1950s. How does it work? What keeps this wheel from falling off the track? So I have one right here. So if you notice, if I go like this, what's holding that up? It's an attraction between north and south. And so when you put it together like this, then you can get that motion. And then you can go around and around and around. So this is kind of a cool invention and very successful toys. When I was a kid, I bought one of these because I thought it was cool. And a lot of kids buy these today. So this is a toy that has an appeal over the ages. Okay, now, what is Phoebe doing here? What do we have here? If we move it around with our hands, we can get it to stack up high like this. And what's making it stand up? Have you figured out what the answer was? It's on its own, it's metal, it's touching, magnetism. So this toy here was, is, is a magnet. The magnet is in the base and then those are just metals and so the magnetism attracts certain metals and then the magnetism goes through and it goes by um, and it'll keep building up. And on our class, usually what we'll have the kids do is see how far you can stack it up. But you can do that if you have a magnet at home, just get um, clips, uh, metal clips, not the plastic ones. But even though the plastic ones do have, a lot of them have metal inside. And you can see how far they can go, how high you can build it. Now let's take a look at this one. It's a pullback car. Kind of pull it back and it it goes how does what is that working now is that magnetism or don't forget what we first learned is it defying gravity something in here is defying gravity and that is there's a spring inside of it and if you look at this one the spring gets so tight it increases its uh, potential energy and then when they let it go it then drives the uh, gear shaft. So gravity, gears, and all those other cool stuff that you'll learn in physics is really important on making some of these toys work. Now let's, with that in mind, let's look at this favorite toy. What is this? How does this work? goes the weasel. And this is Jack in the Box. And so how does this work? It's using, because you got to remember, it's defying gravity by coming up. And that is through your, your gear shaft and making that energy build up and then he pops up. So even Jack in the Boxes um, use um, physics to, in its design. Okay, now let's take a look at a very ancient toy called Jacob's Ladder. This is an old-fashioned Jacob's Ladder toy. Let's see how it works. And you can also make your own at home. Okay. <laughs> okay, Phoebe couldn't get it to go at the end there. But you can make your own. We have, uh, for your teachers, we have a link to a video on how to make them. It's kind of kind of cool because a lot of kids, when you look at these, they think that the that one's falling down to the bottom. But if you look at how, and that's why it's kind of fun, we have the kids make these because there's some, what we call friction, that reduces how it falls down and it just appears to go uh, down from the skies from Jacob's ladder. So this is kind of a cool 
uh, ancient toy. So like I said, there is a video online that has um, specific instructions on how to make it just with cardboard and a ribbon. So um, now let's take a look at um, a helicopter type. Well, a helicopter is not a toy, but if we had a toy to make, and we have this on online, where what does a helicopter do? If you notice those blades, they're getting the air and they're put, look at how the dust is coming up and look at the motion. It's going down and then up to keep it up. And so it can capture air to keep it afloat. And you gotta remember airplanes, even though they're in our everyday life, those were pretty hard to kind of come up with. Everybody was trying to figure out how can a bird fly, but humans can't develop a blade. So they had to understand how, because where you're really defying gravity when you're flying. And so that's kind of the ultimate kind of toy. So we have a little um, experiment that you can do at home. And let's take a look at uh, Phoebe showing us how to make these forces that are on a helicopter and how you can experiment with it. Let's look at Phoebe. We're going to be doing some paper helicopter experiments. So to make this paper helicopter, you're going to need four paper clips, a template from your worksheet, a marker or some colored pencils, and a pair of scissors. So what you want to do is cut along the solid, solid line. So here was a solid line, here was a solid line, and right here I'm going to cut. And then we want to fold along the dotted lines. So for the top, we can fold one this way and the other this way. And at the bottom, we're going to fold along these dotted lines too. And to keep these folds in place, we're just going to pin this up here with a paper clip. Just like that. And you can also decorate these wings however you like. And then once you have your finished product like this, you can bring it up and down. And you can see the wings of the helicopter will flutter. Okay, so now we're going to see uh, how you can experiment. So I'm going to get out of our show and I'm going to come on live. So you guys can um, can see this, so please excuse. Can everybody see me now full screen? Yes? Say, okay. So we're going to, on your worksheet, so I'm going to kind of go around, and Hagos is going to tell me if I'm on, okay, here. So can you guys see me here? Hagos? Good? Okay. So these are the ones that you develop. Now notice um, on the worksheet, we have about four of them. So this is one without a paper clip. And we'd like you to experiment with paper clips on if the more weight you put on it, because you got to remember, this is how we design, physicists design big aircraft. They have to make models and see if they work. So let's take this one here. This is one that has no clip. Uh, I don't think I'd want to be in that helicopter. Now let's take one with one clip. Okay, and I'm going to do this again. And oh, you can't, can't see because it started to do it. Let me put it up a little higher. Oop. Even one isn't too cool. Okay, but let's take a look at two. Will the two do it better? way better. Let me do that one again. As you see it here, and you can flip them, and you go, can go up to three. Oh, look at that one. And you can make these helicopters. So what you can do is design your own kind of toy and see how much weight you would need in order to make the propellers work. So again, just go up. Oop, 
went out of the screen. But at least it gives you an idea of how to um, create these kind of toys. And like I said, in our class, and I'm going to bring this back so I can be in the front of my toys. And then if you have guys any questions on any of these, um, uh, any of these toys, am I okay now? Okay, so guys, it is now um, uh, 10 uh, 50. So do you guys have any questions? You guys are third graders now. Um, and remember like all of these toys, many of them you can uh, buy, you can make, just go online and try to figure it out. So do we have any questions about what we've done? I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't, you couldn't ask questions in between. Hagos, do you see anybody? 